Chapter Twelve of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Richborough's Errand. Wednesday afternoon turned out cold and fine with a watery sun. Isbel arrived at the rendezvous a few minutes before the appointed time, but Judge was not yet there. She was fashionably but inconspicuously dressed in a dark serge costume with skunk furs. At the back of her mind was the desire to correct any possible wrong impression caused by her unfortunately chosen attire of yesterday. After pacing up and down the parade in front of the baths for a good while, however, with carefully assumed nonchalance, she began to fear that her forethought would be wasted. No one even distantly resembling Judge was in sight. Her feelings passed from disappointment to impatience, and thence to anger, by the gradations which are familiar to everyone who has ever been kept waiting. At a quarter past three, she decided that it was inconsistent with her dignity as a woman to stay for his good pleasure any longer. Yet five minutes later, she had still not dragged herself away from the spot. She was really going, when she caught sight of a familiar person approaching her, a surprising vision, which caused her to catch her breath and turn rather pale. It was Mrs. Richborough. She was mincing along the parade, without any great appearance of haste, from the direction of Brighton. Her furs were still very much in evidence, but they were different from those she had worn yesterday, being even heavier and more expensive-looking. She had on a smart black velvet toque, ornamented with a single paradise feather, and was wearing quite new white gloves. Isbel feared that her presence there was directly connected with Judge's absence. She felt wretchedly sure that something must have happened to him. Without standing on pretense, she hurried to meet the widow. They met and lightly touched hands, Mrs. Richborough with a correct smile, but Isbel too worried to think of observances. "'I suppose you come from Mr. Judge?' she demanded at once. "'I do, and I'm frightfully sorry I couldn't get here before, for I know what girls are when they're disappointed. But really, I'm so out of breath with running here. You will excuse me, won't you? The trains, as usual, are running just at the wrong time. You see how distressed I am with hurrying. Never mind. Why couldn't he come himself?' he's unwell no not badly a chill on the liver or something of the kind of course we know he's not as young as he was he wanted to come but i wouldn't hear of it rather than that he should risk more serious complications i offered to act as messenger myself shall we sit down you're sure it's nothing serious oh my dear it's only a cold he'll be all right to-morrow again they sat down side by side on one of the public seats. Mrs. Richborough made a feint of recovering her breath, which Isbel did not condescend to notice. "'Have you brought a note from him, or is it a verbal message?' "'It's a letter, my dear. I'm going to find it in a minute.' She opened her handbag and peered into it with provoking leisureliness. "'Do you know, I feel quite an intrigante. Of course, it isn't a romance.' but I've been amusing myself all the way here by imagining it really to be one. I've a fearfully romantic disposition. Oh, it's only about his house, which my aunt proposes to buy. How disillusioning! So you act as her business manager? I help her sometimes. Is that the note? It's a little crumpled, but otherwise quite intact. Isbel turned the large square envelope over in her hand. It was unaddressed, but sealed with yellow wax. Contact with Mrs. Richborough's scent sachet in her bag had invested it with a heavy feminine odour. She examined the sealing wax more closely than was altogether courteous. Does he want me to read it now, and return an answer? He is rather expecting one, I fancy. Don't study me, my dear. I shan't look. Isbel still fingered the envelope. You're not in his confidence, naturally. That's quite a horrid question. The widow's voice remained soft, but her eye was hard and insolent. 
i'm afraid we haven't arrived at that stage of intimacy yet i didn't know she hesitated no longer but at once broke open the envelope her companion discreetly bent down to lift and minutely inspect the hem of her skirt she allowed it to fall again gracefully and then produced from her bag a little silver mirror in which she critically scrutinized her reflected features in addition to a letter there was something wrapped in white paper and this isbel opened first it proved to be a hairpin she gazed at it in blank astonishment and then hurriedly thrust it back inside the envelope before mrs richborough should see the letter itself was in judge's firm precise handwriting and ran as follows my dear miss lomont i am not quite the thing to-day so please forgive my non-attendance mrs r has very kindly offered to run over to see you and bring you this letter with enclosure the latter was picked up you know where the pencil note i brought back with me from the same place related i am reluctant to inform you only to my own personal feelings and i have taken the liberty to destroy it but i am afraid that your hypothesis is after all correct if you are able to identify the article enclosed we must regard the evidence as conclusive i now propose that we shall go over there to-morrow thursday together mrs r has kindly volunteered to accompany us and if you think well of the proposition perhaps you will fix up things with her she knows nothing of the affair in question very probably i have no right to ask you to come and i do not do so on my own account which i believe you understand but i know what anxiety the whole business is causing you and must cause you so i thought it only fair that the opportunity should be placed within your reach should you desire to avail yourself of it if you are unable to arrange for to-morrow perhaps you could give mrs r another date it is unnecessary to impress on you the desirability of destroying this letter at the earliest moment very sincerely yours h j isbel read through the missive twice then returned it thoughtfully to the envelope and placed the latter in her handbag thanks mrs richborough the widow who was in the act of adjusting her veil turned about with a quick impulsive smile everything satisfactory my dear as regards the main business yes but he says something about our all going over to runhill court to-morrow do let's i'm positively dying to see that place why i dote on these ancient family houses i don't know why i'm more than a little mediumistic that may be one reason if you're so keen you needn't wait for me i suppose mrs richborough's smile faded i suppose not if i could find another woman unluckily i know nobody in this part of the world my own set happens to be up north is there no one at the hotel i'm just a little exclusive i fear why shouldn't you come my dear what are you afraid of you don't know of course i've already seen that place three times there are limits to one's enthusiasm i don't think i'll come thanks this is truly unexpected most girls would be charmed at the prospect of another pleasure party the only pleasure i can see in it is the pleasure of your society mrs richborough of course that is a great inducement no don't be horrid my dear let me put it in a different form perhaps you're not keen on coming but do it to please mr judge the poor man's so proud of his house and so delighted so almost childishly delighted at the opportunity of exhibiting it to his friends for some unknown reason he chooses to set a very high value on my artistic opinion and i have promised to tell him honestly exactly what i think of runhill court and now because you're afraid of being a little bored you're going to dash all our plans to the ground isbel laughed the long and short of it is i'm not wanted for my own sake but only to act as chaperone to you the widow too laughed so energetically that her long white face became quite strange to look at it sounds rather weird for an unmarried girl to chaperone an experienced widow but you know my dear two women can always go where one can't 
after all i have my reputation to lose just as much as the youngest and most innocent of you you will come now won't you i'm still rather at sea mrs richborough is all this solicitude on your account or mr judge's on his because i'm so sorry for him the poor man is so lonely he's lost his wife he has no friends to speak of and he lives all by himself in a seaside hotel where he's surrounded by a set of entirely new faces every day we women ought to do what we can for him i know he can't be precisely a congenial companion for a girl your age but if you'll only act the good samaritan and come with us i give you my solemn word of honour i'll take as much of his conversation off your hands as i can manage oh i don't doubt that in the very least then you consent no i refuse said isbel dryly it's too bad of you won't you give a reason i must tell him something tell him i don't care to he'll understand tell him i don't care to go running about the country with total strangers i don't like it and my friends wouldn't like it thanks for coming over mrs richborough there's nothing else you want to say is there she prepared to get up one little minute more my dear if you don't care about accompanying us would your aunt i wonder you say she is negotiating for the house mr judge of course would bring his car for her i'm afraid if he brought wild horses it wouldn't have the desired effect she's a very difficult person to move there's nothing like trying if i were to walk back with you to your hotel should i find her in she would be in but whether she would be visible is quite another matter i may as well tell you that her interest in runhill court is extremely thin at the moment and as for mr judge merely to mention his name is like holding out a red cloak to a bull she fancies he hasn't treated her with an excessive amount of consideration and that's really why the negotiations are falling on me there would be no harm in my trying though i think i will look in on my way to the station it's the hotel gondy isn't it i fancy i once stayed there you seem quite well posted said isbel smiling with vexation go by all means if you think it's at all likely to answer the purpose only please don't bring my name into it i particularly request that the widow shot her a malicious little glance if it can possibly be avoided my dear it shall be in any case she shall hear nothing of the letter i promise you that i begin to see i can hardly do more can i if we aren't to be friends you really can't expect me to fib for you be reasonable no i really suppose i can't the only thing that still puzzles me is why my humble society should be so much in request such red-hot zeal in the cause of sight-seeing strikes one as quite uncanny surely you can't have told me the whole story i believe we shall come to terms now do you know my dear you're ever so much cleverer than i gave you credit for at first she bestowed on isbel one of those disarming smiles which she ordinarily reserved for her male acquaintances as you are so direct with me i am going to be equally open with you runhill court is notoriously haunted and i am a spiritist that explains everything at last doesn't it isbel stared at her but is it notoriously haunted perhaps haunted is a rather misleading term shall we say queer there's a corridor there which is quite celebrated throughout the length and breadth of the kingdom in psychic circles it goes without saying you must know it since you've been there so many times oh yes but if that's all it's not much not to you my dear for you take no interest in such matters but to anyone who is interested in another world the smallest clue is deeply engrossing possibly you have never lost anyone who is very very dear to you i have and that's the true reason why i'm to be forced into something i don't want excuse my scepticism mrs richborough but you've been rattling out different explanations at the rate of sixty miles an hour for the last ten minutes i'm not sure whether there are more to come the widow threw her a hostile glance such as what that's what i don't know and what i'm wondering you seem to suggest a personal motive i suggest nothing at all 
but it's very funny how long have you really known mr judge exactly a fortnight to-morrow my dear you see there's no question of intimacy between us what is the extent of his fortune really i've never heard mrs richborough showed her long but beautifully white teeth in a smile has he one he has that house of course i confess i've never heard whether he's rich or poor and to tell the truth it doesn't worry me in the slightest i'm afraid i'm a dreadfully unmercenary creature i choose my friends for their distinction of character and not at all for their money-bags i have never had anything to do with money and i hate the very mention of it then how do you contrive to live asked isbel bluntly oh one has an income of course still one leaves all that to one's banker the great art of living happily my dear is to cut your coat according to your stuff now it's getting late what about to-morrow i suppose i shall have to say yes since you're so very persuasive i felt sure you would relent eventually on condition that the whole thing is kept quiet mrs richborough reassured her with effusiveness it had better be in the morning said isbel cutting her short somewhat contemptuously i was going to suggest it i'm so glad you can fit in i know how horribly tied you girls are they call it a free country yet a girl is a perfect slave to her little circle now will you come over to worthing by the same train as before come straight along to the metropole and ask for me the car will be waiting and we can start at once just the three of us how do you know that mr judge will be sufficiently recovered to come oh he will be there's nothing seriously wrong with him my dear i shall pack him off to bed early and see that he gets a really good night's rest isbel stood up he's evidently in good hands any woman would do that much for him it would be abominable to leave him to the mercies of the hotel staff mrs richborough also ascended to the perpendicular position a floating mass of soft furs you don't wish me to convey a personal message oh say i'm sorry he's unwell and that the other matter is all right she extended her hand which the widow hastened to grasp warmly the latter even raised her veil and pushed her face forward but this was too much for isbel who deliberately ignored the invitation mrs richborough recognising her faux pas made all speed to cover it up i hear you're to be married my dear oh yes who told you mr judge hinted at it i'm so glad thanks but i wish he'd leave my private affairs alone he's so isolated and had so little to talk about he has no right to discuss me i don't like it my dear it was only the shadow of a hint perhaps not even that perhaps he said nothing at all and it was merely my intuition well then good-bye till to-morrow by the way if you would care to dash off a few lines to him i have paper and a fountain pen isbel declined thinking the offer rather strange they separated to go their respective ways five minutes later as she passed along the now nearly deserted parade towards the hotel she whipped a hairpin out of her hair and halting for a moment compared it carefully with that which judge had sent her they were identical in size and shape she returned them both to her hair End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain the lunch at the metropole it had been raining heavily but the sky was rapidly clearing and there were great tracks of blue everywhere as isbel mounted the steps of the metropole hotel at worthing shortly after noon on the following day she had been unable to escape from her aunt in time to catch the earlier train but to compensate for this she was free to spend the whole day as she pleased by a lucky chance mrs moore was compelled to go up to town on business judge was waiting in the porch he grasped her hand warmly preventing her apologies it was very good of you to come at all miss lomont as far as we are concerned the time is of no importance mrs richborough will be here immediately even as he spoke 
the widow appeared her tall and lovely form was attired as usual in the rich soft furs and velvets which she so much affected she moved charmingly and her gracefully swaying waist was that of a quite young woman but isbel no sooner saw the angular witch-like face than her old feelings of repugnance and distrust returned as it was so late an early lunch at the hotel was agreed upon before starting they passed into the restaurant here isbel received an unpleasant shock she recognised and was recognised by a girl acquaintance belonging to her particular set louis lascelles who probably was more intimate with blanche marshall and the rest than with her own relations louis was lunching with a couple of youngsters of the subaltern type she seemed in the highest spirits and champagne was already on the table she pledged isbel in a glass from the other side of the room presently she came over to her her dark bold handsome gypsy-like face looked very flushed and defiantly gay so this is where you get to she began throwing a single critical glance towards mrs richborough and judge i'm not the only one it appears retaliated isbel she laid down her knife and fork and looked up calmly you're having a high old time obviously rather we're making a day of it sorry i can't introduce you but we're all here in cog i'm supposed to be in regent street at this blessed minute bravo i'm supposed to be in brighton we'd better draw up a deed louis laughed immoderately what shall we drink it in her eye roved around the table what are you drinking only burgundy i say she bent a whisper you're not having much of a time are you where did you dig them up mrs richborough unluckily overheard surely i know your face she remarked graciously to louis who still held on to the edge of the table your name is just hovering on the tip of my tongue the girl smiled vaguely without even looking at her one sees so many people it's going to turn out quite a charming day i think well ta-ta isbel no manner of use asking you to join us of course you see i can't louis trod lightly back to her impatient squires while isbel watched with some amusement mrs richborough's efforts to regain her composure she seems a pleasant girl remarked judge is she a very close friend of yours inquired the widow of isbel returning however to her plate we know each other fairly well what an unfortunate coincidence that she should be lunching here to-day of all days why asked judge miss lomont rather wished to keep her visit private i fancy i am afraid she is inclined to regard it in the light of an escapade is that really so miss lomont naturally i have appearances to consider however it's no good crying over spilt milk if any one splits it won't be louis quite sure asked mrs richborough with a smile which was almost a sneer i hope i can trust my own friends to behave with common decency judge looked perplexed i hope you're not here against your will why should i come if i hadn't wanted to i'm a free agent can't you grasp mr judge la tante terrible miss lomont is experiencing the fearful joy of being out of school clever but unsound mrs richborough i was thinking more of public opinion you think you are acting unwisely asked judge wrinkling his forehead oh i know if there's any doubt about it the judgment won't be given in my favour lunching in a strange town with quite unknown people strikes me as being exactly calculated to lead to a lot of questions being asked and we know that if a question is uncharitable the answer to it won't be otherwise even if i were to plead altruistic motives i'm afraid it wouldn't be of any avail does that imply you're here out of kindness perhaps it comes to that in the end the pleasure of a chaperone is always rather impersonal of a chaperone miss lomont don't you know i'm chaperoning mrs richborough she made such a strong point of it that really i hadn't the heart to refuse otherwise i didn't mean to come judge's expression was one of absolute amazement here is some misunderstanding evidently mrs richborough was kind enough to offer herself as chaperone to you on learning that you were so anxious to see the house once more the widow actually coloured beneath her paint and powder really 
i'll never equivocate again as long as i live miss lomond seemed so unwilling to join us that there was positively nothing left to do except appeal to her sympathy i feel an absolute criminal oh it's funny miss richborough said isbel don't start apologising or you'll spoil the joke but surely miss lomond said judge you didn't for one minute imagine that i desired to fetch you all the way from brighton merely to act as a companion to another lady i must have made that clear in my letter oh it's a mix-up and that's all about it mrs richborough was obliging me and i was under the impression that i was obliging her when women start conferring favours on one another there's no end to the complications to show our thorough disinterestedness we stick at nothing it must certainly have been a most confusing situation for both of you remarked judge smiling at last however the main point is that we've got you here by fair means or foul and i don't think you need to be in the least afraid of tittle-tattle as we are both highly respectable people if i might suggest a compromise you had better terminate your dispute of generosity by agreeing to chaperone each other since in the eyes of the world i am such a dangerous person then what are we waiting for demanded isbel cheerfully lunch seems to be at an end they stayed for coffee however and then while judge went outside to prepare the car mrs richborough led the somewhat unwilling girl upstairs to her room where for five unpleasant minutes she was forced to inhale an atmosphere almost nauseous with feminine perfume while witnessing the elder woman's final applications of paint powder and salve refusing the use of these materials for herself at the end of that time she broke away and went downstairs alone she found judge promenading before the hotel a rather embarrassed discussion of the weather began thanks for the letter said isbel quietly and suddenly it was my hairpin i decided as much there's no one else it could have belonged to won't you tell me what was in that note you destroyed i can't say no more about it whose idea really was it that i should come over to-day yours or hers mine miss lomond she has nothing at all to do with the business i'm simply bringing her because you can't go with me alone i'd rather it were any one else who is she do you know anything about her nothing i fear except that she's quite reputable don't you like her then not particularly but we won't pay her the honour of talking about her what are we to do to-day i thought we could make a desperate effort to get this mystery cleared up once and for all i fear we must both recognise that things can't go on in the way they're doing it's unfair to both of us isbel gave him a half frightened glance what's to prevent us from finishing now why need we take a still deeper plunge for that's what it amounts to or does it what do you think shall we really ever get any satisfaction i'm fearfully uncertain you place a great responsibility on my shoulders miss lomond to be quite truthful i feel i have no right to ask you to proceed further i would not have written you as i did except that i somehow had it firmly wedged in my head that the uncertainty was causing you great uneasiness it's half killing me we'll go but what are we to do with that woman when we get there it hasn't occurred to me it may be awkward i can see if we don't hurry up and plan something we shall have her trailing after us all the time something may turn up to give us our chance that's most unlikely nothing ever turns up when you want it to we'd better contrive something after this style when we are all three going over the house together i'll accidentally become separated from you and you must leave her while you hunt for me we both know our respective stations but if she insists on accompanying me oh she won't keep it up she'll soon tire of tramping up and down stairs and along interminable corridors in her high-heeled boots searching for a girl she's utterly callous about besides she has a weak heart did she say so no but she has all the symptoms of course you make a point of looking upstairs first judge obviously was reluctant to assent to her plan i suppose we can think of nothing better apart altogether from putting a deliberate deceit on a defenceless and unsuspecting woman we have to consider the circumstance that she will be alone in a large and gloomy house very likely upwards of half an hour and you say her heart is not in good shape i expect she'll survive the ordeal 
and if it's any consolation to you i fancy her own programme won't bear a great deal of looking at what programme is that oh i don't pretend to know the details mr judge only i'm pretty sure she's hatching something otherwise why should she go to the trouble of blackmailing me into accompanying you to-day i don't suppose you're aware of the fact that she openly threatened me with informing my aunt that i had met you privately at worthing you didn't tell me that upon my soul solely for the purpose of getting you to come yes i refused at first i wasn't very keen on her society to tell you the truth but what can her motive be for such conduct i have my ideas on the subject i really must ask you i may be mistaken but my belief is she wants to compromise me but why isbel smiled cynically as a necessary preliminary to breaking off my intimacy with you i imagine you are telling me the most astonishing things miss lomont what interest is it of hers to break off this intimacy oh that's the simplest question of all to answer to keep the matrimonial field clear for herself of course didn't you know she had marked you down i cannot believe it said judge halting to stare at her in his bewilderment if you don't know it i expect every one else does at your hotel the words dropped from her lips with such dry assurance that he felt she must be possessed of special knowledge he was silent for a moment this is a revelation indeed miss lomont i don't know what to say to it all now you speak of it i confess i have had my suspicions once or twice lately but i have always dismissed them as discreditable but really such a diabolical plot against the honour of a young girl is wholly unbelievable it savours more of melodrama oh i won't swear to that part of it but there's something funny up and i advise you to keep your eyes open to the fullest possible extent i mean to i hardly feel like meeting her after this you must though and you must go on behaving to her as nicely as ever remember it's our only chance of going to the house together mrs richborough herself at that moment appeared descending from the hotel i didn't tell you said isbel but we're returning to town next week what you're leaving brighton but this is very unexpected has your aunt changed her plans or what i only knew last night she thinks i'm looking unwell but you are not feeling unwell it is useless to deny that my nerves are a bit jangled replied isabel carelessly then she is giving up all idea of my house i can't say mr judge i shall have a word in the matter we shall see don't say any more here she comes the widow came up to them with a prepared smile i am so frightfully sorry to have kept you both waiting no doubt you have been saying hard things about me people evidently have spoilt you mrs richborough returned isbel when i turn my back on company i invariably expect to be promptly forgotten what ideal modesty people always talk the only problem is have they been pitying us or annihilating us i'm not sure i wouldn't rather it were the second you're still alive was the dry reply judge opened the door of the car gravely without committing himself to a word and the ladies got in while he was settling himself preliminary to starting the widow turned to isbel i understood you might have something to say to each other my dear that's why i delayed that was very kind of you i do hope we're to be friends i like you tremendously already what for i really can't see what i've done to make myself so beloved oh it isn't what one does but what one is i think you have a perfectly wonderful character for a girl isbel did not even smile my dear mrs richborough if you were a man i should think you were trying to make love as it is i don't understand you in the least surely it is permissible for women to admire one another's natures you are so sympathetic and so tactful my dear i'm sure when we know each other better we shall get on splendidly together what good qualities do you bring into the pool mrs richborough alas my dear i have only one and that is a heart so you are to do the feeling while i am to do the sympathising is that the arrangement 
the widow gave a distant rather melancholy smile no one can deny that you are a very clever girl and perhaps that is one more reason why i like you the dialogue was terminated by the abrupt starting of the car isbel glanced at her watch it was half past one End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of the Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the second chamber again. At ten minutes to three, while they were all together in the library on the first floor, Mrs. Richborough and Judge were inspecting one of the corner shelves with their backs turned upon her, thereby effectually excluding her from the conversation. Isbel seized the opportunity to slip quietly from the room. Descending on tiptoe the servant's staircase opposite, she found herself in the kitchens, through which she was obliged to pass in order to regain the hall. As she went by the foot of the main staircase, she heard her name being called. Miss Lomont. It was Judge's voice. She had been missed already, and the mock search had commenced. A short half hour ago, when she had entered the hall from out of doors, in company with the others, those strange stares had not been there. Whether it was that her agitation prohibited the use of her reasoning faculties, or whether that her mind had become surfeited with marvels, it hardly occurred to her to doubt that she should see them now. Hurried to action by the distant hailing, she at once lifted her eyes, anxiously and fearfully, to the wall beyond the fireplace, while still hastening across the floor. They were there. She arrived at the foot of the staircase as in a dream, and stood a moment with one shoe poised on the bottom step, her gaze vainly directed towards the invisible top. Then, without changing a muscle of her face, she began to mount. Halfway up, when the hall was already out of sight, her memory came back, and she started piecing together the incidents of her last visit to that extraordinary region of the house. To allow herself time to thoroughly reconstruct everything, she seated herself sideways on one of the steps, staring fixedly downstairs, with twisted neck, and eyes which saw nothing. The more she recollected of that meeting with Judge, the greater became her disquietude. She kept starting nervously to rise, while the blood ebbed and flowed in her cheeks. If in that interview they had succeeded in keeping within the bounds of friendship, it was obviously it had only been by the exercise of great self-control, and in view of his later confession, who could say what would now happen? The warm sympathy of their exchanges, their almost unseemly anxiety to lay aside all deception with each other, their mutual approval of one another's conduct, upon which the world would pass an altogether different judgment, and lastly, her gift to him of that scarf, warm from her own neck. All this, as it grew slowly together in her mind, appeared to her as something which was irreconcilable with her true character, as something shameless and dreadful. It was like awaking by degrees to the awful temporary insanity, only it was not insanity, it was not even an accidental expression of excited feelings, induced by the strange circumstances in which they had found themselves. It was worse than that, it sprang from the genuine and unfeigned emotion of both their hearts. By what miraculous chance had they met there, at the same hour, on the same day, in the same unreal room of a house, which, less than a month ago, she had not known the existence? Judge had not set foot in that weird room for eight years, while she had never been inside it before in her life, and now, suddenly, they meet there, and within a few minutes she has given him a tangible pledge of her favour. It was more than chance, it was fate. Something, some strange influence in the house, was throwing them together. How far and for what purpose she dared not ask herself. It was of no use to disguise things. Every step they took, inside the house or out of it, 
had the direct effect of entangling them more and more and there could be but one end to it all an end which bore a double face the obverse face was noble uplifting union with a man of unique character the reverse face was social catastrophe she was a betrothed girl and honour commanded that she go back at once it was untrue she did not love judge she did love marshall on the last occasion she had met judge by chance therefore she was not at fault but if now she persisted in repeating the adventure she would be committing a sin of conscience and how would it be possible for her ever to hold up her head again among her friends if she elected to act with such disgusting faithlessness towards a true-hearted man of her own age in order to accept the sudden protestations of emotional affinity of an elderly widower she buried her face in her hands but it was out of the question to turn tail now without first clearing things up if she did it would merely mean the whole torturing business over again the same failure of memory the same anxiety to find out what had happened the same dallyings with judge the same surreptitious visits and counter-visits the same humiliating scheming and deception the same lowering of her entire moral and physical tone and in the end exposure if she was so miserably weak and cowardly so unsure of her own moral fibre that she dared not meet a strange man in a private place for ten minutes in order to finish with him once and for all then affairs had arrived at a very serious impasse and she was desperately turning her back on the only apparent means of escape from an impossible situation however much she dreaded it there was really no alternative to her seeing judge upstairs just this once more not as a stolen joy but in order to put a definite end to their disagreeable intimacy exactly how this was to be effected she did not know but since he was a gentleman he would of course make it his business to devise some plan after all this dreadful manor-house was his he was responsible for what went on inside it if there were mysteries there requiring a solution he had no earthly right to call upon her for assistance she got up and mechanically shook out her garments slowly climbing the remaining stairs she again stood in the familiar antechamber with its three doors without any hesitation whatever she advanced to the middle one and sharply turning the handle let herself into the apartment where last monday she had met judge nothing was different there were the same panelled walls the same polished flooring the same solitary couch at the end of the room she cast a troubled glance round and sat down with heaving bosom to wait five minutes later the door was thrown open and judge walked in he stopped where he was looked anxiously at isbel and at the same time pushed the door to behind him but failed to close it isbel gazed in his direction with equal earnestness but she did not offer to rise i've got away as you can see began judge may i sit down please she made space for him they both sat in stiff attitudes at some distance from each other there was an awkward pause which isbel broke by saying i don't wish to come here again so we must think of some way of ending it i quite understand it's making my existence intolerable it was madness on my part to accept that scarf that's the root of all the mischief i ought to have known that we should remember nothing of the circumstances under which it came into my possession we were both to blame for that it doesn't matter now but i shan't come here again so i wish to ask you to take steps to prevent a repetition very well i'll write a note before we go down and put it in my vest pocket where i shall be sure to strike it but are we not to see that other room isbel glancing at him uttered an involuntary little exclamation what's the matter asked judge nothing but how extraordinarily young you look you are strangely altered too not younger not even more beautiful i think 
but more wonderful it's a weird mystical room there's no doubt have you still no idea where we are none she pointed towards the walls all this is workman's work we daren't think otherwise but the place is intensely dreamlike and yet i can't remember having ever enjoyed a more poignant sense of actuality was it accident or fate that brought us here together last time it has been puzzling me it looks as if something perhaps the house itself were throwing us together without our wills being in any way consulted is such a thing possible do you think we cannot think it of what possible advantage can it be to an unseen power that i should be forced to play the part of a persecutor and you that of a victim aren't we both victims to me we seem like moths fluttering round a lamp i expect a moth has no memory either only instinct and a capacity for suffering i see no end to it we shall return here again and again until our wings are burnt indeed her voice caught a little judge moved closer to her and placed a hand on her sleeve but lightly and without familiarity we are not moths but creatures endowed with reason and we can blow our lamp out without waiting for the tragedy if necessary i will shut the place up and go abroad for a time it won't be long before you have forgotten all about the affair isbel gave him a singular half wistful smile have you sufficient strength of character to do this yes if i were once assured that your happiness is involved to secure that i would willingly burn the whole house to the ground i know it and i know that you know it and that is my reward there was a break in the conversation but she made no movement to disengage her arm after a moment she said very quietly it's just because you ask less than other men that i can afford to give you more you understand that so let it be replied judge are you content i have confessed my feelings and you have not withdrawn your friendship that fixes our relations and i have no desire to transgress the bounds laid down because your temper is naturally noble said isbel all the other men i have met have been plebeians but you are made of different material and that is why you act so differently when i go downstairs again i shall go downstairs indeed they were so absorbed in their talk that neither of them observed that the door had become pushed half open and that a figure stood on the threshold watching them in silence it was mrs richborough it did not appear how long she had been standing there but suddenly isbel looked up she uttered a little scream wrenched her arm free and started to her feet judge followed the direction of her horrified stare and swore under his breath he also got up i'm sorry if i frightened you said mrs richborough quietly without smiling i won't stay but where are we and what does it all mean there was a tense silence i'm afraid miss lomans feels slightly upset at finding herself here offered judge at last in a fairly firm voice i have been trying to reassure her we met here by accident but what part of the house is this i thought the east room was at the top immediately under the roof so i believe then where are we higher still it appears you know as much as i do about it mrs richborough you followed me after all then yes your manner struck me as peculiar and i was suspicious i kept you in sight as far as the east room but there you shut the door after you and i didn't venture to intrude at first your direction was so very decided that i felt positive it was a got-up thing i listened outside for voices for some minutes but as everything was quite quiet at last i did summon courage to enter you weren't there but i caught sight of another flight of stairs leading upwards so very naturally i made use of them and here i am judge heard her to the end attentively and then turning half away began to whistle beneath his breath between his teeth isbel looking very distressed sat down again has either of you ever been here before asked mrs richborough glancing first at one and then at the other i have a good many times in former years answered judge then surely you have some idea where we are i haven't 
his tone was dry and decided mrs richborough launched a queer look at him and began to gaze around her restlessly what's in that other room which one on the right as you come up the stairs the other one can't be anything much what makes you say that questioned isbel surprised out of her silence intuition but what is in that right-hand room i've never been inside it replied judge why ever not most likely it's the key to the whole place someone ought to go in may i go i don't care to ask you mrs richborough it's totally unexplored and you might conceivably meet with an unpleasant experience i don't view these things from the common standpoint for me there's nothing whatever terrifying in the supernatural have i your permission to go of course but perhaps we ought to accompany you oh no there's not the slightest necessity besides you have your talk to finish i'm perfectly conscious of having interrupted you isbel clutched the couch on either side of her with her hands and looked up have you nothing to say about your surprise at finding us together like this miss richborough gave a strange but not unpleasant smile no i have nothing to say about that but of course you have put the worst construction no she passed her hand across her eyes a change of some sort has come over me it is this terribly unreal place i think your meeting is not what i expected to find you must be struggling against your hearts both of you no i have nothing to say and yet you came to look for us yes i did but it's all different as i came upstairs i hated you both and vowed revenge i confess it but now i can't even remember how i came to be like that all that state of mind suddenly seems so trivial and unimportant she was about to move towards the door mrs richborough said isbel abruptly what is it why were you so anxious to bring me here to-day you must know that without my telling you here all things are so transparent to all of us you meant to tell mr stokes didn't you the older woman looked down at her calmly yes i meant to restore you to your duty but now i no longer pretend to know where your duty lies let me go now my dear all that is ancient history everything has changed isbel said nothing more but allowed her to leave the room the door closed behind her judge resumed his seat we need not fear this development he said slowly she will remember nothing so much the worse for she will go back to her plots and schemes you haven't thought of that the suggestion startled him you think so how can it be otherwise oh if her present mood lasted i should never never wish to speak ill of her but we know it will disappear with her memory what is to be done he preserved silence for a few moments after all there's no cause for alarm she will demand her price and we shall pay it no no she will accept nothing short of the whole i know her in that she will be disappointed and so she will do whatever mischief she can oh i'm quite sure of it what do you mean by the whole she intends to marry you and failing that failing that she will dishonour me or perhaps she means to dishonour me in any case you heard with your ears what she said but if i consented to marry her i should of course make her silence a condition the words came in a very low voice as he bent his head towards the floor what do you mean she demanded sharply how could you marry her you don't love her no then it would be wicked of you what put that awful thought in your head i can't understand yet it would solve other difficulties too what difficulties what difficulties can a wrong marriage solve it would be criminal some such decisive step must be taken to end the situation our friendship won't continue to pass unnoticed you wish to terminate it then for your sake not mine and to achieve that result you accept a living death but perhaps you do really love her no isbel laid her hand on his arm promise me never to think of this again it is absolute madness we will find some other way out of our troubles promise me you may be sure of one thing 
replied judge looking at her steadily i shall not renounce my moral right to devote my life to your service except as the very last resource beyond that i cannot go suddenly isbel raised her head and seemed to listen to some sound outside the room what was that she asked quickly it sounded extremely like a stiff window shutter being jerked open it's probably mrs richborough in the next room he had scarcely spoken when another noise more distinct and far more peculiar struck their ears it's music said isbel shaking from head to foot and attempting unsuccessfully to rise yes a bass viol but some way off i can't conceive what it can be would you wait here while i go and investigate no you mustn't i won't have it i won't be left judge sat down again and they went on listening in silence the low rich heavy scraping sound certainly did resemble that of a deep-toned string instrument heard from a distance but to isbel's imagination it resembled something else as well she thought she recognised it as the music of that dark upstairs corridor which she had heard on her first visit to the house but this time it was ever so much nearer fuller and more defined the electric buzzing had resolved itself into perfectly distinct vibrations a tune was being played so there was no doubt about the nature of the noise it was a simple early english rustic air sweet passionate and haunting the sonorous and melancholy character of the instrument added a wild long drawn out charm to it which was altogether beyond the range of the understanding and seemed to belong to other days when feelings were more poignant and delicate less showy splendid and odourless after the theme had been repeated once from beginning to end the performance ceased and was succeeded by absolute stillness they looked at each other how beautiful but how perfectly awful said isbel do you wish to go downstairs at once some seconds passed before she answered no i'll stay how could we leave it without finding out we'll go in there in a minute i don't wish to while she's there let's finish what we were saying you mustn't commit that crime your honour comes before everything you don't belong to her she drew a long breath before proceeding you belong to me i do not belong to you yes you know it is so i beg you to reflect upon what you're saying you're not yourself at present don't use language you will be sure to regret afterwards isbel ignored his interruption i have lied too much to my own heart and it's time i were honest they talk of faith and loyalty but how can one be loyal to others if one is not first loyal to one's own nature there cannot be a greater sin than to pretend that our feelings are what in reality they are not this is no place for such deliberations i beg you earnestly to say no more here and now reserve it until later no i must speak if i don't speak out now when shall i get another chance my engagement has been a ghastly mistake it must have always been in the back of my mind but now i see it all clearly for the first time she crouched nearly double and covered her face with her two hands judge much agitated got up i can't listen to this it's impossible for me to discuss such a subject it rests entirely between you and your own heart i made the terrible blunder of imagining that identity of tastes and friends means love i took things too much for granted his nature had no depth he has never suffered it isn't in him you must think it over in quietness say no more now she sat up suddenly and stared at him you throw me to him then you who profess to have such ideal love for me judge was silent so you don't love me in the end you will understand that i love you deeply and truly she slowly rose to her feet then what do you advise me to do do nothing at all but wait you have no questions for me what questions i love no one but you said isbel 
she caught his hand and crushed it hard in hers then abruptly turned her back on him judge stood like one transfixed at the same moment mrs richborough came into the room her natural pallor was intensified while her face was set and drawn as though she had received a shock oh what's the matter exclaimed isbel taking a step in her direction the older woman swayed as if about to fall judge hastened forward to support her i'm afraid i've just seen a sight which i can only regard as a warning as you look out of the window there is a man with his back turned he looked round and then i saw his face i can't describe it i think i'll go downstairs if you don't mind the others looked at one another shall i take you down asked judge if you would assist me to the head of the stairs i shall be all right he asked no questions but at once supported her from the room isbel followed on arriving at the top of the staircase he lent the dazed woman his arm down the first few steps then watched her out of sight before rejoining his companion again they gazed at each other you heard what she said remarked judge quietly under the circumstances i don't feel justified in asking you to accompany me into that room are you going yes i'm going then i shall go too End of chapter 14「Fifteen of the Haunted Woman」by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Music of Spring. They walked over to the right hand door, which Judge, after turning the handle, at once kicked wide open with his foot. A sudden and unanticipated flood of brilliant sunshine, streaming through the room from an open window on the further side, momentarily blinded them so that they staggered back with the shock. Judge was the first to recover himself. It's all right, we can go in. The room's empty. Isbel hastened to the window. It was breast high. There was no glass in it, but it possessed a stout wooden shutter, opening outwards which at present was swung to its full extent squarely against the outside wall. The aperture of the window was so narrow that there was barely space for their two heads together, and she found her smooth cheek grazing his harsh one. From out of doors came not only the sunlight, but the song of birds, the loud sighing of the wind in its passage through the trees, and an indescribable fresh sweet smell as of meadow grass turned up earth and dew drenched flowers it seemed more like spring than autumn where are we then was isbel's first inquiry uttered in a tone of bewilderment how do we come to be high up from the ground i don't recognise any of it it's all new to me from the foot of the house wall forty feet below the free country started judge stared in vain for familiar landmarks the more he gazed the more puzzled he became not only had his own grounds disappeared but neither in the foreground nor in the distance was there a single sign of human occupancy or labour look where he would fields hedgerows roads lanes houses had vanished entirely out of the landscape a bare hillside of grass and chalk perhaps a couple of hundred feet high, fell away sharply from the house, to terminate in a miniature valley along which a brook, glittering in the sunlight, wound its way. Beyond there was a corresponding hill up, but not so steep or high, and here the woods began, an undulating but unbroken forest appeared to extend right to the horizon, many miles distant. The intensely blue sky was adorned with cirrus clouds, while the dazzling sun was high above their heads about half a point to the right apart altogether from the strangeness of the scenery anything less than a late october afternoon would be hard to imagine the forests were brilliantly green many of the smaller isolated trees in the valley were crowned with white blossom 
while the air itself held that indefinable spirit of wild sweetness which is inseparable from a spring morning just look at that man said isbel suddenly he was sitting on the slope of the hill directly opposite their window and not a stone's throw from them but half hidden by the crest of the small hollow which he had selected for his perch which explained why they had not previously noticed him he sat motionless facing the valley with his back to the house what he was doing there they could not imagine it was his extraordinary attire which had evoked isbel's exclamation only his head the upper half of his back and one outstretched leg were visible but the leg was encased in a sage green trouser tightly cross gartered with yellow straps the garment on his back resembled as far as could be seen a purple smock and the hair of his hatless head fell in a thick bright yellow mane as far as his shoulders notwithstanding isbel's amazement she began to laugh no wonder poor mrs richborough was startled is it a man or a tulip he looks like an ancient saxon come to life replied judge also laughing but more moderately ulf perhaps very likely he agreed without understanding her cry out and ask him if his name's ulf but who was ulf don't you know why he's the man who built your house the trolls ran away with him poor fellow and probably he's been sitting here ever since yearning to get back home again do call out you really want me to call if you don't i shall and that will be immodest judge shouted at the top of his voice the man neither responded nor turned his head again commanded isbel laughing louder much louder as if someone were running off with property of yours this time judge roared and then isbel added her strange clanging cry twice or thrice laughing between whiles but still they were unable to attract his attention temporarily abandoning the effort she turned her head and glanced sideways at judge with an almost joyous expression we can't be in october that hawthorn's blooming and look at those beeches over there with their pale green transparent leaves hark they kept quiet for a minute a distant cuckoo was calling the cry was regularly repeated at very short intervals judge rubbed his eyes in actual doubt whether he were awake or dreaming it's spring sure enough but how can it be oh if we could only get down into it all both instinctively measured the wall beneath them with their eyes but the distance to the ground was too great the footholds were too precarious she leant further out inhaling the sweet fragrant air in deep breaths and sighing it out again beautiful beautiful then once more she became fascinated by the man it can't be true such men don't exist at least nowadays it's an optical illusion if it were a real person he would answer us judge hailed him again but without result a moment later however the man stooped to pick something up and when he regained his sitting posture they caught a glimpse of a fiddle-shaped instrument in his hand somewhat larger than a modern viola wasting no time in preliminaries he swung his bow across it and at once started to repeat the air they had heard already from the other room isbel drawing back a little rested her elbow on the window-sill and her face on her elbow in order better to concentrate her thoughts on the music judge retired altogether into the room to make space for her the tone of the instrument notwithstanding its small size was midway in depth between that of a violoncello and that of a contrabass and the low slow scrape of its strings had a peculiarly disturbing effect upon her feelings the theme had a strange archaic flavour as though it had come down through the centuries yet it was so appropriate that isbel could almost fancy it to be the voice of the landscape it was hauntingly beautiful and full of queer surprises each long sonorous note contained a world of music in itself but it was the powerful yet delicate and passionate thought slowly being developed as the air proceeded 
which stirred her so exceedingly while she stood listening feelings which she had not had for ten years suddenly returned to her and she realized as in a flash how far down the hill of life she had already travelled that complex state of youth composed of wildness melancholy audacity inspiration and hope was momentarily restored to her but only as a memory as if for the purpose of mocking her as the music finished tears stood in her eyes and her heart was choking yet she was not unhappy judge approached her from behind isbel it was like the voice of spring she said without turning round you are tortured but you don't know what is happening to you music must have been like that at one time did you feel it too it must be very very old they hardly knew what they were saying to each other the musician had sunk back into a reclining position so that only the crown of his head was visible isbel at last looked round she caught sight of judge's face with its contracted muscles and pained expression but instantly left that to glance at an envelope which he held in his hand what have you there he handed it to her i found it lying on the floor the envelope was addressed to mrs richborough at the metropole but its contents had been abstracted on the back had been scribbled very roughly in ink the first few bars of the tune they had just heard it has probably got blown down suggested judge she must have left it for the ink to dry and forgotten it in her alarm isbel looked at it for some moments and then slipped it into her handbag that woman will take notes on the day of judgment but why shouldn't she that music could have meant nothing to her what does it mean to us they stood close by the window but not looking out isbel's face bore a singular smile it means something i think what do you feel nothing i feel great happiness which i am striving not to account for it means what spring means said isbel she suddenly threw both arms around his neck clutching him tightly but at the same time turning away in such a manner that it was the back of her hair only which brushed his cheek when she disengaged herself violently a few seconds later her face was hot and she was in tears judge breathed hard and looked dark under the eyes but he made no attempt to draw nearer what's wrong isbel you are cruel i cruel oh go away from me altogether she turned her back on him and bent her head will you listen to me i have no right i know you've told me a thousand times already you put law first love second i demand a very small assurance from you but that assurance i must have are you free now i won't say i refuse to answer i'll have everything or nothing from you she wheeled round furiously if i'm not worth that i'm worth nothing at all the scent of violets and primroses seemed to come in with the breeze through the open window while isbel's voice like soft brass thrilled the ear with its strange range of tones she stood there confronting him a warm passionate girl in sweet clothes as though she were a second self his own soul reflected from a magic mirror among the whole world of human beings they too alone possessed the entry into each other's innermost nature that delicately modelled woman's mouth which had just uttered such words of scorn if he pleased in another instant it should break into the loveliest smiles as they faced one another in silence the music out of doors recommenced without warning it was the same everlasting tune isbel twitched impatiently and abruptly turned her back on judge again but though the theme was the same the execution was markedly different that she had to listen despite her agitation the playing was faster higher lighter and staccato the lingering haunting sweetness was transformed into a delicate and triumphant dance the very sunshine which flooded the room seemed suddenly to become more joyous and ethereal without understanding or wishing to understand how the change had been effected 
she felt her brow clearing her heart lightening judge waited until the last note had died down and then said in a low voice i find i'm not as strong as i thought i was so i'm yours to do what you like with tell me to jump out of the window and i'll do it you're the only person in the world for me End of chapter 15「16 of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain the musician departs isbel commenced unbuttoning her left-hand glove with slightly trembling fingers something is to go out of the window but not you she removed the diamond ring from her third finger and eyed it pensively before handing it to him throw it out let strange find strange i never should have worn it better to return it to the giver as long as i carry it about with me i haven't cast off the past do as i say that episode is finished judge without further demur took the ring to the window and dropped it out that's done said isbel drawing a deep breath we shall have no more anxiety from that quarter Raising her ungloved hand, he bent over and kissed it submissively. She offered no resistance, but closed her eyes as if to think the better, reopening them only when he had relinquished her fingers. Had your wife been still alive, would you have done as much for my sake, I wonder? Don't doubt it. I would have sacrificed everything, but let the poor girl rest in peace. Fortunately, my loyalty wasn't put to the test during her lifetime that magic word loyalty how can we be loyal to those to whom we don't naturally belong you mean fortunately you were enabled to act a living lie with her without either of you suspecting the fact you know you never loved her what has been has been whatever we felt towards each other after all she was my dear companion you can't grudge her that isbel laughed lightly i grudge her nothing if you assure me you loved her even i should accept your word but you didn't love doesn't come twice in a lifetime however to avoid competition it seems i must aim at higher things than being a mere dear companion you must be aware that in that sense companionship is impossible between us said judge in a low voice tell me why because i am a man and you are a beautiful girl and all our ways and thoughts are strange and foreign to each other because my place is not standing face to face with you exchanging incomprehensible ideas but at your feet smothering the hem of your skirts with kisses he stopped abruptly her eyes danced but why waste precious kisses on inanimate cloth you're quite justified in laughing i know my language sounds exaggerated pardon me i'm excited and i am i cool do you think now finish it all and kiss me quickly judge looked at her slowly you grant me this favour without my asking it do you want it in writing to make quite sure oh what are we here for why have we been brought to this place except for this very one purpose for half an hour i've done nothing else but count the minutes disappearing one by one isbel he approached her almost as if disbelieving did you imagine that women's feelings had been left out of my anatomy laughed isbel pressing both cheeks with her fingers in an automatic attempt to cool them but as they were on the point of meeting the music sounded again through the open window its scrape was so strangely insistent that they remained where they were until the interruption should come to an end a moment afterwards however isbel walked quietly to the window to see what could be seen resuming her former attitude of leaning one arm on the sill the tune was as before but once more its interpretation was varied the gaiety had gone out of it and it now possessed a swift smooth strength which curiously suggested an incoming tide neither of the other versions had been half as beautiful it was like a quick tragic irresistible summary of all which had gone before nothing had changed in the landscape the sun shone the trees waved 
the brook glittered at the foot of the chalk hill the musician remained half concealed half visible as his body swayed in unison with the rhythm of the theme the entering breeze brought with it the smell of growing life while as an undertone to the music many a soft cry of nature reached isbel's ear but as she continued to listen it seemed to her as if the world were at last moving after a long enchanted dream as if a current had begun to run and things could no longer be what they had been hitherto her heart deepened she felt suddenly that she had up to now been playing with life but that reality had at length clutched her in its grasp and now she must show what stuff she was made of she was like a bather for whom a river proves too strong and who is being walked downstream step by step struggling in vain for footholds until her waist is covered and she must either swim or resign herself to be carried away to death her old happiness was past recovery it rested with herself whether she were to be borne along backwards looking after it despairingly or whether she should throw herself audaciously into this new element confiding in her strength and courage to bring her to safety she realised that this was the moment she had been waiting for all her life the music stopped isbel faced round towards judge but did not stir from the window these interruptions have a strangely agitating effect he said with a quiet smile apparently he means neither to take notice of us nor leave us in peace i see you are rather deeply moved and you are not when you are present music can be no more than a decoration of life you are the centre of the piece and the disturbing factor if he plays again i shall suggest that we return to the other room we have seen everything here there is to see you wish to resume where we left off but i don't think we can henry can't you understand that all this has a meaning don't you see that it's carrying us higher and higher if you have forgotten your own words i haven't what words we were talking of tests you said that one test of love is the craving to sacrifice oneself at the time i didn't understand you but it was fearfully true when a woman loves a man there are no half measures with her she wishes to give him everything of course sacrifice isn't the right word to express it a gift like that gives nothing up judge trembled slightly in spite of his control why do you say all this i want neither sacrifices nor gifts from you and you know it but if i offer it there was a short silence let me understand you said judge perhaps we are at cross purposes what is it that you are offering me myself was the low-spoken reply overcome by her own daring without waiting for his response she turned her back on him again and stared out of the window with a dull shock she perceived that the musician had risen at last to his full height his tall broad gaily attired figure was visible from top to toe but his face was still turned away he held his instrument by the neck with one hand and seemed to be contemplating a descent to the foot of the hill isbel immediately glanced round to judge henry he's up now he joined her at the window i thought he was going to sit there for ever said isbel he seemed a part of the landscape will he turn round now do you think it's an extraordinary business muttered judge he's real enough but what man goes about in that sort of costume or plays that sort of music i've a feeling that if he's going we'd better make haste after he's gone things will be different i don't know whether we ought to attract his attention or not judge continued staring at the man in silence although the sun shone and the sky remained clear but with few clouds the tree-tops were sighing and swaying in greater agitation than before and little swirling wind flurries kept coming and going in the air freshening the room and swinging the outside shutter to and fro with a harsh musical creak is there no way of getting down demanded isbel the next minute it's awful to be shut up here in this box of a room while all that's going on if we walked on and on through those woods 
where should we come to he sighed you're right our place is down there in god's fresh air but it's most remarkable he doesn't once look round can it be that he's sublimely unconscious of the existence of a house behind him no he knows well enough but i mean to see his face if not now another time look he's off the musician had begun to walk down the steep hillside with short steps digging his heels into the turf for security they watched him fascinated until he reached the bottom when instead of proceeding straight ahead up the opposite hill he moved to the left along the bank of the stream though his action was quite leisurely he never once paused or turned his head so doubtless he was making for a destination in a few minutes he would be out of sight round the bend of the valley it's too late now but why didn't you call out to him again demanded isbel i purposely refrained from asking you to as i wanted to see what you would do you attach such importance to it he brought us together it was his music i heard the first time i came to runhill and it's plain to see he's had a hand in everything it's natural one should want to see one's benefactor judge led the way into the room and once more they faced each other she cast her eyes down her arms falling limply on either side i was frightened on your account isbel but that is not what i want what do you want i want you to feel what i feel i want you to feel that as long as you are with me nothing can hurt either of us fear spells cold blood but i think you can't be passionate or else you wouldn't scorn my gift so do you think i do i know you do for otherwise you would have accepted it i have accepted it and you're blind and foolish not to have seen it at once isbel's eyes leapt to his face with a flash you accept my full love yes your full love said judge setting his jaw hard there's no other kind worth the price we're paying be it so but i accept it in deep humility for the gift is far too rich and i have done nothing to deserve it i shall dedicate the rest of my life to your service she approached him unsteadily you must know that such a gift can't be paid for by service there can only be one return for passion and that's passion if you haven't that to give i want nothing that you shall have in full measure replied judge he moved forward to embrace her at the same moment quite suddenly the sun went in the wind ceased and every outside sound stopped as if cut off by a screen the brightness of the room changed to twilight while the air became perceptibly colder and at the same time stale smelling judge's upraised arm fell slowly to his side as he mechanically shrank back both turned their heads inquiringly towards the window then isbel walked over to it almost with reluctance to look out henry come here quickly he was already beside her the landscape they were looking at was no longer the same immediately beneath them were the familiar grounds of runhill court the chalk hill diminished in height had become the sloping lawn with its continuation of the field they had traversed on the day of the picnic in the background were other fields innumerable with roads lanes and cottages the unbroken forest of fresh green trees was transformed into scattered tracts of woodland the prevailing colour of whose leaves was russet the sun had disappeared the country was wrapped in a misty dusk the musician was nowhere to be discovered they gazed at each other in consternation during which time their excitement rapidly subsided are we dreaming now or were we dreaming before asked isbel earnestly laying her hand on his arm we can't doubt this at all events wasn't that real then have we been the fools of our senses i fear it looks extremely like it what has it all been false judge shook his head grimly but did not answer at once anyway it has happened in time there's no harm done but what we can cover up and forget we must be thankful for small mercies she turned fiery red has it really come to that at least as you two have been involved 
you will acquit me of deliberate wrongdoing. I fear it's hopeless trying to reconstruct our state of mind, or to understand what has taken place. Some unpleasant agency has been at work. They went back into the room. So you don't love me? demanded Isbel quietly. Yes, I love you. You know that, if our senses are restored, my ring is not restored. Unfortunately, I know it only too well. So it means that your old generosity has come back. They stood for a long time, looking away from each other. Then, with death in her heart, Isbel started to put on her glove. We had better go downstairs again. He bowed with stern gravity, and at once moved to the door, which he held open to allow her to pass out. She walked straight across to the stairs, without once turning her head to see if he were following. The hall, when she reached it, was in dusk. Her watch told her that it was nearing five o'clock. She looked dully around her, remembering nothing of what had occurred to her during the past hour and a half, but somehow confusedly wondering why Judge had failed to descend that staircase with her, though, as a matter of fact, she did not even know whether he had been up there. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Twilight. The staircase had vanished. The house was in silence. Evening was closing in, and her companions were absent. Isbel's heart throbbed heavily. She felt sick and weak, yet she thought she ought to go upstairs to look for them. She knew that Judge would not have departed without her. She considered that it would be best if she were to go straight upstairs to the East Room. The prospect of visiting that remote part of the house so late in the day did not inspire her with any enthusiasm, but anything was preferable to waiting about in that awful hall. It was most singular why they should be so long. She made her way upstairs slowly, stopping at every sixth step to listen for sounds, but all was quiet as a tomb. As she groped her passage along the night-like corridor at the top of the house, it occurred to her for the first time that she had never yet seen the East Room, though all her acquaintances seemed to have done so. She smiled rather contemptuously. Well, it would complete her experience of the place. The door stood wide open. It was dim twilight within, and the apartment did not strike her as very noteworthy. It was small and square, with a single window on the far side, very poorly furnished. But as she stood at the door, looking in, her eyes immediately fell upon something which completely took away all her interest in the room itself. Mrs. Richborough was lying extended on the floor, with Judge kneeling beside her. She rushed forward quickly. Whatever's the matter, Mr. Judge? Is she ill? He looked up from bathing her forehead and lips with the contents of a pocket flask. It's a swoon, and a rather bad one. I couldn't leave her to come down to you. How did it happen? I don't know. She was lying like this when I came down. Isbel turned hastily from the unconscious woman to look at Judge. Then you have been up? Yes, and you? Yes, but I remember nothing, nor, of course, you either. Nothing, he went on dabbing Miss Richborough's forehead. Is that doing her any good? Hadn't we better try and get her downstairs? Her pulse is stronger, and I think she is coming round. It's hopeless to think of a doctor in these parts. If we can get her in the car, we'll soon run her down to Worthing. She must have had a fright of some sort. But how came she to find her way up here? I suppose she looked everywhere for me. I've been staring at something on the floor over there for some while, but haven't been able to get up to investigate. It looks like a ring or a brooch. She may have dropped it in falling. Isbel followed the direction of his finger, detected the article and picked it up. It proved to be a lady's diamond ring. It is a ring, and a rather nice one. It's very much like mine. 
as she spoke the words she instinctively felt for her engagement ring beneath her glove it was not there she whipped off the glove in dismay her third finger was ringless the recovered ring fitted it perfectly it is mine she went on with a desperate effort to keep calm but unable to keep a slight break out of her voice what you surely must be mistaken it's my engagement ring and ought to have been on my finger they stared at each other you're sure yes i'm quite sure then what is it doing here miss lomont i can't understand it you haven't been in this room before i have never been in this room before in my life and i wore this ring at lunch to-day she retained it on her finger and replaced her glove over it at the same time mrs richborough's face and neck stirred uneasily and her eyelids flickered judge remained on his knees how are we to understand it do you suppose demanded isbel after a long pause in the increasing darkness i will not suggest what i don't think miss lomont and i may not suggest what i do think oh i know what you mean and it's ghastly it can't be her face suddenly crimsoned she felt as if she were on fire but perhaps i don't know what you mean what do you mean i cannot say but i can give you a piece of counsel you came here to-day to end a mystery and you have started a still worse one things can't go on like this so i strongly advise that you make this your last visit to my house this is the second time something has happened without your knowledge or consent it's the uncertainty which is so horrible oh can't something be done have you no initiative at all mr judge you call yourself a man it's high time to retrace our steps we've already gone too far i think my best plan will be to shut the house up altogether i think i will do that he applied himself to moistening miss richborough's lips with the brandy her limbs began to move restlessly it was evident that she was on the verge of regaining consciousness after a moment or two he again looked up i have only to express my sincere repentance at having invited you here this afternoon miss lomont of course i should not have done so and i am very sorry for it my only excuse is that i knew no more than yourself she made no reply mrs richborough at last opened her eyes judge bending lower obliged her to take a sip of the brandy and the powerful stimulant had a nearly instant effect upon her heart she struggled into a sitting posture supported by his arm and smiled wanly where am i what has happened it is i mr judge and this is miss lomont you have fainted how idiotic he forced her to swallow another mouthful of the spirit and the colour started to return to her cheeks you'll be all right in a minute or two we'll get you downstairs to the car make you comfortable and run you home in less than no time feeling better already aren't you but so absurdly shaky i remember now i had a sudden fright it was horrid and i was all alone we'll hear about it later never mind now with isbel's assistance he succeeded in raising her to her feet she was established in the chair while the girl set her attire to rights she started looking round on the floor uneasily there should be a ring on the ground somewhere can you see it it has been picked up said isbel shortly oh it belongs to me can you tell me how it comes to be in this room mrs richborough it fell down from the wall i did not know it was yours judge and isbel exchanged glances how do you mean it fell down from the wall it does sound stupid but so it happened that's what frightened me it seemed to tumble on to the middle of the floor from nowhere at all but you said from the wall which wall mrs richborough turned weakly in her chair and pointed behind her that wall where the stairs were previously it rolled on to the floor and i was just going to pick it up when i must have fainted but what stairs are you alluding to asked judge she smiled closed her eyes and was silent for a moment how can i explain it sounds incredible but i saw a flight of stairs in the middle of that wall ascending out of sight 
i actually went up them or could i have dreamt it all i am afraid my mind is all upside down this afternoon isbel coughed dryly and glanced at her watch judge again pressed his flask on the widow i won't thanks my heart is scarcely in a state to stand over stimulation if you could help me i think i could make my way downstairs that would be best for everybody judge offered her his arm on getting outside he shut and locked the door of the room putting the key in his pocket you had better lead the way miss lomont take my torch slowly and with frequent pauses they passed through the corridor and descended the stairs to the hall judge was about to proceed outside but mrs richborough asked to be allowed to sit down to recover her strength tell me she said after a minute where did you both get to i can't understand what happened perhaps we have been where you have been mrs richborough replied isbel coldly oh do you mean that are you pretending you saw those extraordinary stairs too unless they were a figment of your brain why should not we have seen them as a matter of fact i don't speak for mr judge i did see them and went up them i too said judge then we are either all mad together or something very strange has taken place possibly you can tell me where they led to no my memory is a blank until i came down again and you mr judge i also remember nothing mrs richborough suddenly lost colour and her breathing grew difficult she recovered herself by a violent effort you must both have gone up before me and come down after me how was that and how did your ring come to fall down out of the wall a ring doesn't escape from one's finger of its own accord i cannot answer the conundrum isbel's face was like granite if i were an engaged girl i should not like such a thing to happen to me have you no idea how it could have happened no it's very strange mrs richborough essayed a laugh if it did not sound absolutely insane one might almost suppose you had been playing pitch and toss with it isbel went white to the lips but she said nothing you take it very calmly proceeded the widow let us hope that mr stokes when he hears please hold your tongue mrs richborough it has nothing whatever to do with you i have not even told you that it is his ring you are taking a very great deal for granted you only wore one ring at lunch my dear and that was on the third finger of your left hand very well then it is my engagement ring what of it must i ask your permission before accidentally losing it i assure you i haven't the slightest wish to interfere in your affairs still sometimes the advice of an older woman oh advice well what do you advise i think it is only good sense to try and find out something more about it let us assume that the explanation is supernatural she looked up with a malicious half-smile or can you account for it in some other way i have already told you that i can't account for it if you have any useful suggestion to make please be quick about it i suggest that we all come over here again in the morning and pursue the investigation i cannot see what else there is to do why should you trouble to come again because i have mysteriously lost and found a ring because i wish to responded miss richborough coolly and if i refuse i shall assume that you consider my society undesirable and and act accordingly isbel opened her bag to take out her handkerchief in doing so she encountered among its miscellaneous contents a strange envelope the light in the hall though fast fading was still sufficiently strong to be read by and she drew the letter out to see what it was it was addressed to mrs richborough she turned it about in a puzzled manner this appears to be your property how it comes to be reposing in my back i have no idea the widow took it almost rudely it certainly is mine there's no letter inside you haven't that inside your bag i suppose she searched hurriedly in her own 
it's all right i have it myself i am sorry but what in the world are you doing with the envelope there's nothing written on it by any chance suggested judge thoughtfully mrs richborough turned it over to see the back yes there is what led you to inquire if it's nothing personal do you mind my looking i can't make head or tail of it it's music she handed it up to judge who gazed at it for some moments with a kind of uneasy rumination isbel looked over his shoulder i only got that letter by this morning's post so those notes must have been added since who did it isbel gave an icy smile we needn't stare at each other so suspiciously it's sufficiently obvious what has happened you wrote it yourself upstairs mrs richborough and i picked it up and brought it down with me you really think that i'm convinced of it then all i can say is we're living in the land of dreams continuing to gaze at the back of the envelope she started to whistle softly through the roughly written notes of music the others listened intently the tune was unrecognisable yet there was something strangely perplexing in it it broke off abruptly in the middle there was no more written down they stole questioning glances at each other the gloom of the hall deepened suddenly the fragment of air which mrs richborough had just whistled was repeated by a distant stringed instrument which seemed to possess very much the vibrating timbre and deep register of a double bass it continued to carry the theme to its proper ending the sound appeared to come from a very long way off for though quite clear it was extraordinarily faint it gave them the impression of being high over their heads but for all that seemed to belong to the house it lasted for little longer than a minute then everything went back to silence judge stood looking as though he were still unable to grasp what had happened isbel's white face bore a peculiar smile but mrs richborough was obliged to take deep and rapid breaths to prevent herself from swooning again she sat erect in her chair holding on to the arms what was that demanded judge at last it reopens everything replied isbel what do you mean it looks as if they do not mean to leave us alone we are not to be allowed to go back so we must go on so be it i am content i don't understand you i think you do but it doesn't matter i must ask you to speak more clearly miss lomont it's not what i say or what i do but what is being decided for us mrs richborough was quite right we must come here again to-morrow please take me outside murmured the widow weakly judge at once moved to her assistance but the girl stepped in between wait a minute she faced judge do you think things can stop here have you no manhood at all what do you imagine it all means i must refuse to take the responsibility of inviting you to this house again miss lomont he attempted to speak with firmness but his voice trembled if we go on as you call it nothing but unpleasantness awaits us that is manifest in the meantime we ought to hurry home as fast as possible she is seriously unwell mrs richborough really looked ghastly he hastily produced his flask again which this time she did not refuse after swallowing a portion of the contents she felt better i shall be quite well in the morning mr judge she managed to say the next minute perhaps there will be no great pleasure in coming here again but we all have a duty to perform miss lomont's whole future happiness may be involved he eyed her sternly what makes you say that i am neither more intelligent than you mr judge nor more enlightened there is not the slightest necessity for me to explain my words i insist upon our all coming here to-morrow morning you insist that's what i said i will not consent to leave things in their present uncertainty i also am implicated in a certain degree if you really refuse i shall have to consider where my further duty lies that is plain enough language i think mr judge 
said isbel dryly you had better accept it is the smaller of two evils judge looked at her but made no reply he offered his arm to mrs richborough and she at last got up from her chair they quitted the hall the two women took their places in the car after locking the house door judge approached isbel to ascertain her wishes with regard to being set down at her request he consulted his timetable to discover if there were a convenient train from shoreham he found one which would not involve an unreasonable detention at the station and it was arranged that she should alight there he was then about to leave her to take his own seat when she pulled quietly at his sleeve what are you feeling she asked in a low voice you must know tell me one thing you haven't altered towards me no i haven't altered you have been so cold you don't wish to break off our friendship judge worked his jaw pouched his mouth and looked away no i don't wish it but perhaps it will be necessary you are made of stone i think but i'm coming here to-morrow very well if it can be arranged i strongly doubt whether she will be fit and if she isn't that is a question which answers itself miss lomont i'm coming over to worthing by the same train in any case expect me you don't altogether despise me do you hush he nodded significantly towards mrs richborough how could i oh she doesn't hear her eyes are closed then you will wait for me to-morrow yes with or without her we must go there's nothing else you wish to say to me now nothing you are sure quite sure isbel sighed as she sank back on the cushioned seat two minutes later they started down the drive End of chapter 17